so my name is Dimitri Muna. Um, I work at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Um, it's doing work um, with genetic data um, as a kind of bioinformatics. Bioinform um, but as you can tell from this picture, um, my background is more astronomy. So what I wanted to talk about is uh, another way that um, I think uh, annotation would be very valuable uh, from a research scientist's point of view. Um, <clears throat> so I've been very interested and have uh, experience working with uh, user interfaces for scientific data. Um, I worked for nine years on a project called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, created a web interface um, uh, for, for the data there. Currently, as I mentioned, the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, um, building data in interfaces um, for genetic data. Um, I'm working on a project called the Starchive, which is to collect a lot of information about um, uh, stars that are closest to Earth, um, and a couple of other projects um, as well. So user interfaces are very important to me. Um, <clears throat> so we in astronomy, of course, have a huge amount of data. Just as a couple of examples, there's a satellite that um, did a data release um, just a couple of weeks ago, and it, it's a, basically the format of the data release was a table of 1.3 billion stars. Um, there's another survey that's been running for a number of years, and they had a, a data release. Just the one data release from the one survey was 1.3 petabytes of data, um, covering three billion objects um, that they, they recorded in the sky. So for, in astronomy, we've got these gigantic tables, and that, that's not even talking about images um, as well. So genomics is uh, similar. Um, it's not quite the scale of uh, astronomy, um, but uh, genetic sequences, um, you know, the cost of doing a sequence has dropped you know, to like roughly $100 in some cases. Um, and that just means that that's a huge amount of data that's going to be generated or is being generated. Um, so sequences, um, you know, will have hundreds of millions to billions of uh, base pairs. So, so uh, again, it's just a large amount of data. And that's just two fields right now. Of course, you know, most, uh, most scientific fields are, um, are generating a very large amount of, um, of data. So to handle this data, to analyze this data, often what we do is we aggregate um, the data. We, we, put, we create plots, we get statistics on the, the data, we use machine learning. Um, there's too much data to look at each individual point um, individually. Uh, so we look for trends to understand the underlying models. <clears throat> so just as an example um, and an excuse to have a pretty picture, uh, this is um, the M3 globular cluster. It's just basically a large collection of about half a million stars. Um, that are all kind of gravitationally bound together. So I might take these stars from a particular survey measured from um, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, it's a public data set, um, and I can create a plot here. Uh, so you can see you know, very clear trends here, so you can see the underlying kind of models, um, and I won't go into the details, that's definitely off topic. Um, but if you look at, it's, and you may not be able to see it on the screen here, but there are a lot of, outside of these very strong trends, there are a lot of stars kind of in these these empty spaces. And in some of those spaces, it's not really physical, it's not really some, you wouldn't expect stars there. And so, but we see, you know, a number of them here. If you were to come a little bit closer to, you know, there's, there's a bunch of kind of these outliers. Um, so what, what is going on with these stars that are kind of off on the side here? Are they maybe two stars that are too close together so that they look like one and we're counting them as one, but um, the values are, you know, making them appear different, a place in the different part of the plot. Maybe it's not a star. Maybe the star that we're, is in this plot is not part of that cluster. Maybe it's an instrumental effect. Um, maybe it's just not a real thing. Uh, it could be a data processing error. It could be something new. It could be something that is unexpected that maybe we should pay a little closer attention to. So there are a number of reasons why, uh, you know, these outliers can exist. And from a scientific research point of view, I don't want to just throw those outliers away and concentrate on this, you know, thing that I'm expecting to find. I want to know what's, what's going on with those. Um, so to study these outliers, um, to look for the new thing, or potentially the new thing, we need to look at that. We do need to look at the individual data points. Um, this requires human intervention. It requires domain knowledge to be able to identify whether it's a new kind of object or it's just an instrument error and, and expertise. So people will do this, and once the outlier is identified, um, nothing kind of happens. Some One researcher will find it and make a note of it, and maybe they'll publish it in a paper or maybe they won't. They'll just say, oh, this is an instrumental effect. It's not that important. I'm not going to write a paper on that. Um, and so what happens is we have these public data releases, but the data releases aren't updated. Um, creating the, uh, uh, a data release takes a very large amount of work, time, and effort, um, and often once they're released to the public, it's kind of up to the public to do what they will with them. So they're, they're typically considered static. Um, if I had um, 
the classifications of objects. So from that data set, some things I might flag as galaxies and some things I might flag as stars, um, and that will be in part of the data release. Well, those aren't, those classifications aren't updated later. So somebody 10 years from now could be using that data set, which is a very valuable data set, and say, just give me all the stars, and some of the things that they get will not be stars, and some things will be missed from that. Uh, so bad data is not typically flagged um, after the release. Um, so if some, some other scientist wants to look at that, they're going to have to go back and basically do that same analysis or, or look at those points. Um, so that got me to thinking, what I'd really like to do is be able to um, annotate individual points of data. So not this entire data release of 1.3 billion records, but that one row in that data set. Uh, so to do that, the first thing I, I would need to, to do is come up with a descriptor for, for those individual data points. So these are kind of my goals for this. I want it to be easily generated. I want it to be reasonably human readable. Um, I'd like it to work with the hypothesis infrastructure because that gives me a lot for free. Um, I don't want to require that the data creator define the descriptor um, because it may be that the data creator doesn't find this interesting. It may be that the data came from the 1970s and there really isn't a canonical source to create those data descriptors. Um, just to keep things kind of simple, I want to only refer to publicly released data sets um, rather than something that somebody just collected on their computer. Um, I want the file format, I want to be file format agnostic. I don't want to say that this has to be in this format or that format. Um, the data is kind of the data for me. <clears throat> and then I want the descriptors to be easily citable and searchable. Um, so I'm sure many people here in the room are familiar with this. Um, this was pointed out to me um, earlier this year. So there's uh, something called RRID, um, the uh, resource, uh, Research Resource Identifiers, which kind of addresses a lot of what I'm talking about here, but it's, uh, it's really more specific to uh, kind of the, the biology field. And what I'm hoping to do is kind of take this idea and try to expand it. This is kind of my proposal to, you know, let's just say all science, just start from there. Um, <clears throat> so why not use um, DOIs? Um, so DOIs um, would be appropriate for the entire data set itself, like the data release, I think. Um, but you wouldn't generate like 1.3 billion DOIs you know, for every row in a table. Um, I, I think that's not really the, the, use, the correct use of those. Um, and I also don't want to wait for somebody else to, to create those if the, you know, the, the creator of the data um, chooses to or not. Um, <clears throat> so just a, a quick review, um, URL versus URN. Everybody's familiar with the URL. A URL has an access protocol, a uh, location of the resource, and then a path to the resource. And then optionally, you can have some kind of query or fragment um, attached to the end of that. So we're familiar with what a URL looks like. Um, so I think that a good data descriptor for science um, is not going to be a URL, but a URN, um, which is very similar. Uh, so a URN is uni uniform resource name. And the difference is mainly that um, the URN points to a resource, but it doesn't tell you where the resource is. It doesn't have anything, anything to say as to where you can find it. So it's not resolvable in that sense. Uh, it remains unique. It's supposed to be a, um, to identify a resource for over a long period of time. So just as a very simple example, um, an ex a URN could be, there, there is a, a scheme for this, uh, which is ISBN, so the, the, um, the numbers for books. So a U URN is, you know, kind of like you would say HTTP, but so it's just saying this is URN. The domain, kind of the namespace, is ISBN numbers, and then there's the ISBN number. So this doesn't tell you where to find a copy of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It tells you that this is the identifier for that book. So of course, there are many, many copies of that book. Uh, you can go to many places to get them. You may have your own copy. You should have your own copy. Um, but there is no one canonical copy or location um, for that. So that's re those are really the goals that I want for the, the scientific um, uh, set. Uh, that's a good question. I think this is the paperback, actually. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to walk through uh, just a quick example of what this might look like for a particular data set, just a concrete example. So um, I've already kind of mentioned this. There's a satellite um, from the European Space Agency called Gaia. Uh, they just a few weeks ago released a data set, as I mentioned, 1.3 billion stars. Um, the, the mission is to record 1%, measure the distances to 1% of all the stars in the galaxy, um, which is kind of amazing. So the data release is basically a table. It's a tabular format. Each row has a unique integer identifier, so that kind of, we get that for free. Um, and then there are many different columns um, uh, with different values that have been measured uh, for each star, for each row. Uh, so 
this could be a, an example of what a de data descriptor might look like for this. So URN, um, SDD, so this is kind of the namespace that I'm coming up with, meaning scientific data descriptor. Uh, I want to narrow it down a little bit more, so I want to say this is within uh, astronomy. So Gaia isn't something that's you know, maybe specific to astronomy, maybe another field has something else called Gaia, so I kind of want to have um, a bit of a namespace there. So I might say SDD, um, Astro, and then Gaia, which is the data source. Um, DR2, which is what the name of the release is, so that's uh, data release two. So that could be you know, data release product number, a version number, you know, whatever, and then a unique identifier that, that identifies that row. So this is just an integer that is pulled from that table. The number is actually quite a bit longer, but um, just a, a unique um, identifier. So this would be detailed enough to point to one row in that table. Um, and I can also start to take advantage of the URL style um, additions to that. So if I just wanted to pull out, so the, 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 the URN before refers to all of that the entire row, but I could refer to individual columns. So if I put a hash mark and say RA and DEC, which are two columns in that table, then this identifier would pull out just those two pieces of information for that one star. Um, and then I can expand this a little bit more. So um, I can turn this into a query. So the going all the way from URN to DR2 points to the entire data set. And then instead of pointing to a particular row, I can say, uh, give me all of the, uh, or, or this would highlight um, or identify all of the, the rows with an RA and DEC between 10 and 20, um, and then maybe a, a DEC, or RA between 10 and 20, and then a DEC between minus one and, and one. The, the, the columns aren't important, but um, this would describe, in a very short way, a, a subset of that data. Um, <clears throat> so we can take advantage of the fact that these data sets are static um, and make references to aggregate values. So. If I have a user interface and I have a billion rows, but I want to create a histogram of that, I can't, I can't download that um, data or expect users to download all of that data. So that's something that can be done on the cloud, though. So here's the URN that says, goes all the way again to DR2. And then I can say AGG, just to indicate I want to get an aggregate value, and say hist for histogram. And then this is going to give me a histogram of all of the rows, the RA values um, between 0 and 60. And so this doesn't say how this is done. Uh, the implementation is left to some other thing. Um, I don't want to say what, what this has to be, but this just describes that, uh, that information. The implementation can be done elsewhere. And then you can do other things like minimum, maximum, you know, sort of things like that. Um, so the use cases for this, um, with, with Hypothesis, uh, the current thing is to, uh, you know, the, the thing that you're attaching um, annotations to is a web page. That's the unique thing. Um, so I want to kind of take things away from the web page, or at least have other options. So if I have a desktop application, um, and I have a, let's say I open a file that has a list of, uh, that's just an image of stars, I'd like to be able to say, just with a quick API call, um, how many of the stars in this field have annotations attached to them, and then just display them right there. Uh, so this is really focused on the data points themselves. Um, I'd like to be able to have researchers make comments on that data. So if they looked at that one outlier and said, oh, this is an instrumental effect, just to put that, that point there. So the next time somebody comes across that data point, they can see, oh, well, this is somebody who knows the, who's very familiar with the data, they're the instrumentation specialist, and they said this is bad data, so now I can uh, throw that out. Uh, maybe there's somebody who has uh, particular expertise, a domain knowledge, and they'll say, oh, this is a very good example of this, oh, this is a, a good example of um, something else. Um, and then I can go and say, well, give me all of the um, annotations that this particular person has made so I can kind of look over their shoulder and see what things that they have, um, what comments they've made on particular points of data. Um, there's automated classification that can be done. So uh, one, you can have um, models basically running in the cloud, analyzing a bunch of data, and then saying this data, the point, um, is a best fit for this model, or this data point is not a fit for this model. And that can just be done automatically. Um, it dramatically lowers the bar for shared research. So typically we're, what researchers do is they look at data um, and then they put in a whole lot of work and the ultimate result is a publication. Um, but that's, there's a long ways between looking at data and having something to say about the data and then actually writing a paper and saying something you know, definitive on the record. Um, you might just look at a piece of, um, a point of data and say, oh, this looks interesting because of this, but that's not you know, worthy of a paper. But that's still valuable information uh, that would be interesting to see. 
Um, and then there's serendipity. So if you open uh, a particular data file and you're not looking at it from the point of view, let's say you open uh, um, you know, a bunch of stars and there happens to be a quasar in that image um, that you may not have recognized or you're not as familiar with quasars. So you just open up a, um, an image in a particular program and it says, oh, there's, the, there's a quasar in this image. And maybe that's connecting, connected to something that you're working on um, and that's just pure serendipity. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential power for that. Um, so it might kind of look like this. This is a program that I've written for uh, visualization of astronomical data. I would just open up an, an image um, that I'm, I'm working on, and then on the right-hand side, it would just tell me, you know, there are 10 different objects in this field that people have made comments on, and then I can go and see those. So what I really want to do is lower the bar as much as possible. I don't want people to have to even go out to look for these annotations. I want to bring them to the same tools that people are using to look at the data day in and day out. Uh, just really lowering the bar for how much effort somebody has to put in to get to that. Um, so I've been talking a lot about astronomy, but it, this really applies to kind of any kind of scientific data visualization. So here's um, a gene tree, and so you can imagine somebody clicking a particular gene and then seeing the annotations um, appear there. Um, so this, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of start a conversation with this. This is um, what I really wanted to, uh, to talk to people about um, at this meeting. Um, so how would this, for people who are um, doing kind of scientific research like this, uh, you know, I'd be very interested to hear how this fits in with the data that you use. Um, are there use cases that are not covered? I'm, I'm sure that there are. There are other things that I can think of that I didn't have time to go into. Um, is the scheme that I proposed like sufficiently applicable to different disciplines? Um, I'm only, yeah, <laughs> just shaking heads, no, it's not. Um, that's what I want to hear, so I'm very interested to hear feedback on that. Um, and. Um, so URIs are not locatable by design, um, as I mentioned, um, but it would be useful to be able to say, okay, I have this URI, and maybe go to a web page and you know, see kind of a visualization there. So I think I don't necessarily want to say this can't be locatable, um, and so that's another part of the, the conversation that I'd be interesting, uh, interested to have uh, about that. Um, and that's basically it. So we've got some hands up already, and we are taking questions. We're going to start with Anita. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks for mentioning our IDs. Woo -hoo. Um, so, but the uh, the so I, I salute you for for trying to do something that's very hard and very interesting. Um, I think Tom is going to tell you how that approach is not going to work or whatever. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. But. Um, you know, I think this is this is really uh, exactly the right kind of conversation that we need to be starting um, in general, how you refer to data and how do you do it atomically. So those are all really good things to think about and those are all good things that I thank you for, for bringing those up, right? <laughs> um, what I really wanted to know though is, um, I have completely forgotten my question other than thanking you for, oh, sorry. Um, so one of the use cases that I can see really clearly is um, there is a, there's a database in geno uh, genomics that's called ClinVar. And uh, ClinVar is something that everyone in their brother downloads uh, every five minutes. Uh, they download that entire database, um, and the first three months of their project is spent cleaning up that data. And everyone has to clean up that data in exactly the same way. No one's willing to share their particular cleanup because they're not 100% sure that they did it right. So I always thought that the annotation on top of ClinVar would be one of the most absolutely amazing things that could be shared among the genomics community. Um, Courtney, do you have anything <laughs> to add to that? Because I know you guys have cleaned up ClinVar. <laughs> so this is, this is actually one of the, the, the very good use cases for this, is that let's say you're looking at a piece of data and you're trying to clean it up or you're trying to say something about it. You're not anywhere near the point where you're ready to publish something on this, but you might say, this looks very similar to this other thing, or this probably doesn't look right. I think that's exactly the level that I'm looking for with, with uh, this kind of annotation. It's, somebody's not really kind of putting their name on the line, they're just saying, this looks kind of like whatever. We have a question here in the front. Um, so may, maybe you said this, but I'm interested in what your thoughts on 
the relationship between the data point and the claim about the data point is. So in your astronomy example and in the genomics example, in the astronomy example you've got a, a data point that represents a star. And you talked about the star, but actually what you're talking about is the data point that you think is the star. That's right. And so the, the, those are two different entities, and there's a essentially a probabilistic relationship between the two of them. So, and, and with genes, a, a good example there is you have like the reference database where you say this is the RAS gene, and then you have another data set and you say this is what I'm saying is the RAS gene based on you know, uh, some right. kind of deduction. And so ha in, in when you think of your, it, so that's actually in your ISBN analogy, it is, it's more like the difference between the ISBN and the various representations of the different editions of the book, et cetera, and translations. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a big role for annotation there in matching those two distinct sort of parallel universes, and I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, so that, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that. So that's, um, some, that's one of the reasons that I've kind of wanted to do this in the first place, is that that's exactly right. So if I go to a particular data set and it says this is a star, um, I, that may be a star and it may not be a star. I don't know that. Um, but there's, there are people who have, you know, maybe like extra domain knowledge or, or expertise, and they can add to that conversation. So that maybe a grad student who's looking at it you know, they did a search for stars and they got some stuff back and they said, okay, well, I did a search for stars, so what I got back must be stars. Um, that somebody else will come in and make some kind of, you know, annotation to that. So really one of the goals that I want for this is this would be a first step in kind of coming up with a new catalog. So if there's a particular data release, then we can have people look at the data and say, well, you know, we, we ran these models. There's new data that came out, um, you know, that, you know, that, this data set's five years old, new data is available that can help me find more information or say something more specific about this data. And the, the ultimate goal for that is to kind of collate all of this and then say, well, this is like, I'm going to put a, another version of this data release out. So I can say, SDSS put out this data release or Gaia did this data release. I'm going to use, com, you know, combine these, inf these pieces of information, use the, the information that I get from the annotation and put out kind of my own data release on top of that. So here's my copy of the catalog. Um, where I'm, I'm correcting things that I know are wrong. Um, but that's right, I think you don't always know, that's the whole point of like the cutting edge of the science there, is that you don't necessarily know, you have like a probabilistic idea of what something is, um, and I want that to be reflected in here. Absolutely. Dimitri, thanks for the presentation. I, I, when I was uh, hearing what you were saying, that one of the thoughts that occurred to me was the way that this might be particularly useful in, say, the social sciences or other disciplines where there has been a kind of development in wings between, say, qualitative research and quantitative research. And I can imagine a lot of data sets where you might also want to introduce some storytelling element or some narrative component. And it, I think it was the second to last slide where you showed your visualization and you were able to see at a quick glance which of these data points are annotated or have some kind of potential narrative attached to them. Are you aware of other examples where science data has been annotated for storytelling or for scholarly communication or public communication purposes and what you think might be a, a good model for uh, bridging some of the qualitative quantitative divides in some of these so socialist, social science disciplines? Um, I have two thoughts on that really quick. Um, so there's a, a project called the Galaxy Zoo. Um, so this is a citizen science project. So if you imagine um, images like this and we have like a few million of them, like several million of them. Um, classifying galaxies is actually a very difficult thing to do with computers, and so there's the citizen science project called Galaxy Zoo, which trained users, just you know, anybody on the internet who wanted to do this, and kind of trained them to, to identify different kinds of galaxies. And then people went in and then just like, okay, here are the million images, just go. And people loved it, and they, they went through that data set. Um, there were, they didn't have annotation, I think, they, I don't know if they had annotation on particular images, but they certainly had forums and people were talking about, you know, individual objects that they thought were interesting. Um, and so that, that became a, a, a way for people to learn 
um, you know, who didn't have a science background, but were very interested. And they spent a lot of time like researching, you know, the different kind of galaxy types and they went through the data and, you know, when they found something unusual, like everybody got together and they were talking about it. It's like, what is this thing? And um, they actually discovered something that the scientists who hadn't, hadn't discovered before doing it that way. Um, so there's absolutely, you know, the, an educational component and a discovery component um, for that. Um, as far another aspect of the education is, you know, as I mentioned, um, I want to have automatic um, computation going on in the background. So if I have a model for a particular star or, or a kind of galaxy, I want to be able to have this model just go and analyze all of the points, and then it's the the output. You know, would be what is the likelihood that this point? This would be the annotation. What would the, what's the likelihood that this is matches this model? What's the the match on this model? Um, so that when somebody like, you know, grad student goes in and clicks one of these points, they'll see, oh, well, 10 models have been run, and some of them have very low probability of match, and some of them have high probability. But I just don't, I don't want just the name of the model, I want them to click on a link, you know, that's in the annotation, and go to a page that describes that model in detail, and they can go see the source code to see how it was calculated. And so they can, they, they're, it's like really connecting the theoretical and the physics side of it uh, with the, the actual data that they're using on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you have a question over here? Yeah, I think it's actually more of a follow-up. There was a session last year um, where I think somebody, one of the data analytics folks from Airbnb presented their desire to annotate their log time series to be able to tell narrative stories about why did this happen and collect all of their post-mortem events around that kind of annotation um, on what, you know, it's not nominally a scientific data set, but if I told you this is a weather time series and this was a hurricane and this was an Airbnb outage, you probably couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> Thank you for the, the presentation. Really enjoyed it. And uh, as a researcher, you know, I, I see immense value in this. I guess one thing that wasn't clear to me is why reinvent a unique identifier for the data set itself versus using, say, a DOI and then doing everything that you do after that, adding the, the unique row and the, the operations and the aggregate functions and, and all of that sort of as an extension of an existing uh, naming convention rather than you know, saying, oh, well, we're, gonna, we're gonna have now astro colon uh, you know, uh, Gaia, you know, right. and then et cetera, versus sort of you know, saying, oh, well, you need a DOI for the data release and then we do all these operations on top of that. So when, when I started thinking about um, this scheme earlier this year, one of the first things that I did is I sent an email to the European Space Agency who released the, the DR1 data set, which is the most current release at the time. And I kind of mentioned this a little bit and I said, and they didn't have a DOI uh, minted for the data set. And I said, oh, this would be really useful if you could create a DOI for this. And they said, no, we're not really interested in doing that. If you need to cite it, uh, <laughs> if you need to cite it, just, um, you know, we have three papers that describe the methodology and you should use that. And so now I have to choose between one of three um, DOIs that really relate to the same data set. So that doesn't really make sense. And you know, do I mint a DOI for somebody else's data set? Um, you know, that's, that's part of the problem. And the other thing, there are some data sets in astronomy that are decades old. Um, you know, these glass plates that are from, you know, that are stored at Harvard that were recorded in the 50s are actually still really valuable. There's no one to create DOIs for, like, for all of those. So some things, yes, but some things not. That's, that's kind of the point, is that, you know, if, if there aren't people, if the, peop, if the people who aren't, who created the data set aren't around, or if they are current, but they're not willing to create a DOI, then, you know, who, do I just do that? I mean, <laughs> that's, that's kind of the problem. Yeah, and, and I've been told, like, just, we'll just go ahead and create a DOI, and that's, that could be an option, too. So but, we should, oh, sorry, Dimitri. Oh, I was just going to, uh, just kind of, men I mentioned it before, but I wouldn't want to create a DOI for like every row in the table. And that's, that's the other part of it too, is I do, I do want to reference each one, so. Yeah, I don't want to pay for, yeah, <laughs> a billion DOIs. <laughs> okay, we should probably move on. So a big hand for Dimitri Muna. Okay.